you know, everything is manufactured, right? I mean, everything that we have on, we, we, we drive, we, our food, everything. And it's just so significant to be, to have people know how important that is. And so 20 years ago, I may not have been in the manufacturing business, but I saw that everything's a business. Mm -hmm. And then in order to be successful, you need partnerships, you need resources. And um, I learned that 20 years ago to get relationships that will best network you to the right people, that you find that a lot of people have the same issues. A quick interruption to mind you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari Santiago. Welcome back to the Made in America podcast. I am so excited to have Melanie Hoban on from Goodwin University, the Director of Workforce Development, a topic that is near and dear to everybody's heart in manufacturing in Connecticut. Melanie, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. Well, listen, it's the Made in America podcast. So we always start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Well, I believe at Goodwin University, we strive to make industry leaders. Ooh. And why do we strive to make industry leaders? Well, you know, it gives opportunity for um, individuals to do other things in life. You know, people go to college sometimes for four years because that's the right, that's the right thing to do, right? That's, that's what I grew up with. Like, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to go to college. But when I went to college, you know, I didn't end up doing what I went to college for. <laughs> So I feel like we actually give opportunities to people where otherwise they wouldn't have that. Really strong refrain, right? How many of us know somebody who is doing something other <laughs> than what they graduated in their major? Maybe the easier number to count would be the number of people who are doing something uh, that was in their major, right? Right. Um, so let's talk about, I like to get into the personal, Melanie. Okay, sure. So how did you get to Goodwin University and what makes you passionate about workforce development? So... A little bit of my background, um, out of college, I worked for actually Governor Weicker, Ooh. and um, yes, and then I continued on there with the uh, Roland administration and went into economic, economic development agencies and actually helped, actually helped recruit businesses into Connecticut at the time, mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and I worked at the Capitol, I was a legislative liaison, and I helped uh, bring some legislation or look for legislation to um, help the economy with DECD. And um, during that moment of time, I realized how manufacturing, I used to go to the, the committees and sit on the, um, the committees and listen, listen to this testifying of manufacturing and how important it is for um, people to understand that the significance of manufacturing and what it is to our economy. So from there, I ended up um, moving on to another career path, which was actually working at a manufacturing company. No. Yeah, yeah. It was, so I actually was in the trenches of, of seeing what it was like when the sales didn't come in and how important that is. And, but from there, I um, had the wonderful opportunity to work for Goodwin University. And um, being the director of workforce development, I can utilize the, the 20 years that I have, I have met so many different wonderful people to partner with, to leverage our resources, to help, you know, our, our workforce in, in Connecticut. How long have you been doing the workforce development thing at Goodwin? For four years. Four years. So talk about that journey. Like you got started. What did you think it was going to be like kind of being in workforce development? Well, you know, it's, um, it's a pretty amazing job because when you think about it, we all need a skilled workforce, right? When I was 16 years old, my first job was Roy Rogers. Mm -hmm. I was I was working at Way Rogers and I learned customer service and I've taken that responsibility at 16 years old and and taken it into my into my adult years. Um, but as the direct, director of workforce development, you also have to have that customer service. You have to have the relationships with the companies. I work with over 100 manufacturing companies, many of which that have been on your show. Mm -hmm. um, and I just love the fact that we can help them some way. Um, upskill their workforce because you want retention and you want expansion. 
So it's really interesting you kind of bring that up. I think there's, when we think about workforce development, right, you know, sort of talked about in the beginning the idea of not everyone needs to go to a four-year school. And for people that maybe have a passion for doing, working with their hands or whatever, they could go to manufacturing, yeah. um, which is great. Uh, you also just talked about upskilling. Like kind of what's the relationship in workforce that you see between sort of new skills and sort of reskilling or upskilling? Um, well, I mean, if, if you mean like how the... Uh, trajectory is changing from manufacturing things are going to automation now but you still need to have your basics you mm -hmm. still need to work on bridgeport you know or in which we have at google university you still need to understand and and cnc obviously is still very um is is very significant right now everywhere you go um but as we know things are changing and like we do have a robotics program and mm -hmm. so we're we're definitely working with that um, one of our major um courses that we have is mechatronics, which actually is, is somewhat robotics and such. But I just feel that moving forward, the, the economy is going to change, the world's going to change as we can already see it. And um, we are usually within that parameter of knowing what's going on, because our president, Mark Steinberg, is a visionary. And if the, if the need's out there, he wants to fulfill it. So when you're thinking about workforce development, I guess maybe what I was trying to drive at a little oh. bit was there's two different directions in workforce development. Okay. There's developing people to get in, then there's enhancing the people that are already working. Okay. So, and so okay. Where, how do you split your time and how do you think about those two different things? Or maybe there's more things I haven't even thought of, but no, no, those the, are kind of the dichotomies I usually think about. No, very good question. Um, so in my job, I work with manufacturers and I assess their needs for their incumbent workers. And that is upskilling generally their their positions to go to other certain positions you know right now there is a gap with that in in each manufacturer you talk to what is the major thing they they say is a challenge it's the workforce mm -hmm. so we and in my job help to upskill the present workforce they have the incumbent workforce to be more competitive so, and then then the company will become more productive so give me some examples of like how that works and, you know, or like, hey, I talked to this manufacturer, you don't have to give, use names, but, yeah. you know, generally, what are you, what are you hearing out there? You had talked about mechatronics, you talked about automation, you also talked about sort of basic skills, right? Like operating a regular bridge port or blueprint reading and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so when you guys are out there, what do you hear is the, the biggest need to help the workforce move forward and drive efficiency in, in manufacturing? So that's a very good question. Um, we actually, believe it or not, you already, you just mentioned it. It's, it's a lot of quality. A lot of quality, and I believe because, um, you know, let's face it, uh, Connecticut is one of our, has a huge aero, aero, aerospace um, portion of, of the world, and um, they want a lot of lean principles, blueprint reading, GD&T, um, we do Kaizen, um, and I know you might want to touch upon this a little, a little later, but we also can provide this training in our mobile lab also. So um, we are getting that, that is the most requests that we have, even um, Six Sigma also. So a lot of people asking you guys to help teach lean, yeah. basically. Lean so, so how does that work? Like I just say, hey, I want lean people show up and they get leaned. Like what is it, <laughs> you know, how does it work? So well, one of our instructors will go to now, even though it's the pandemic and we are as the uh, state's reopening, we will go to the facility and it's a 45, 45 hour course. It's for a green belt, let's per se. Um, and they will teach for 15 weeks, three hours a day. Wow. And they get a certificate also. And usually it's project-based because the company wants to be about a certain project. So the, the company comes, so it's coming, well, help me through that. So I'm, okay. uh, if I'm a manufacturer, yeah. what would have to be right for me to want to do this and what do I get from it? Well, I feel like, I think the when the company's like, you know, the, the employees aren't quite understanding, you know, how to keep things lean at at the um, say uh, the facility or whatnot, and if they're working on a project, maybe they all need to work together in a certain way. Then these are the certain um, uh, these are the certain courses that could help with that. You know, help them guide them through maybe challenges that they're facing when they're going through their um, production. Yeah, it's a big. It's like you know, I think training is one of the things that's kind of hard to quantify, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you buy a new machine, you sort of think about how that's going to work for you. You hire a new employee, you think about how that's going to work for you. But training, I think, is an area that people sometimes struggle to invest in. 
So when you're talking to somebody about thinking about why it's important to invest in training, how should someone be thinking about that? How should they think about the return on investment from investing in their workforce? Well, yeah, that, that's a good question because I get, I get pushback with that sometimes. You know, it's like, well, Melanie, I can't, I, I can't take those people off the production line. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, it's kind of like catch 22. You know, you, you're going to, but you got to, you know that you're going to need the training sometime. So they kind of bite the bullet and they, they realize what's important and they look at and they assess what their priorities are and they come back to us and say, okay, we're ready. We're ready to go. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and majority of the time they're, they're, they're thrilled that they did. You know, and we're always going to need, I think, anywhere, even in my position, right? We're going to need training. You're, you know, not your position, though. <laughs> you have all the training. <laughs> That's not right. No way. Absolutely. <laughs> always be learning, right? There's only two ways to go. It's either forwards or you're falling behind. You got to like, you got to keep the, you got to keep the training going. So, I mean, so you, you find that people are investing and they're getting a lot, they're getting a lot out of it. They're thinking about it. What, how, what is the state of Connecticut doing to help people to facilitate this training? Because you talked about, listen, the cost of the training is probably not the material issue, right? That's right. I think people probably more think about, oh my gosh, I'm going to take somebody off the line three hours a week for 15 weeks. Like, how am I going to compensate for that? Especially if you want to have multiple people training. So what what programs are available to help people do that? Or, or how can they think about paying for those things? No, really, really good question. Um, so we have some really great programs at Goodwin. We actually have one through the State Department of Labor that ha actually subsidizes 50% of the cost of the training. And then Goodwin has a uh, scholarship also fund that we can help scholarship part of the training also. So essentially, it's a, it's a good opportunity for a manufacturer, and it's cost prohibitive also. Um, during these types of training, they could be four hours, uh, which is, um, it could be uh, a certain like lean principles, let's just say, for example. It could be eight hours for a blueprint reading. And the cool part about this is that we can actually bring the mobile lab to you, too, which the mobile lab is a 44-foot trailer. Um, picture something like you would take to a football game and, like, go tailgating. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Everyone just has, like, a 44-foot <laughs> mobile home just hanging out in their backyard ready to go tailgating. So, uh, but it, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat. It's, um, it has, like, desks in there, Wi-Fi, we have a 55-foot television, I mean, it's actually wonderful for the company with all kidding aside because it saves them time and money. They're not, they're not sending their employees out anywhere, and they actually are staying right there. And it kind of keeps the morale up, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we actually do it in a way where it's kind of it's, it's just comfortable for everybody. We have coffees and bagels in the morning. You know, like it's, just, it's like welcome, and, and it's very inviting for the training. Because let's face it, a lot of employees are like, oh, no, I have to, I have to go to training. You know, and this actually, we've gotten really good feedback from it. That people feel like they're growing, or what's what's the feedback? The feedback that they are growing, actually. I mean, can somebody grow for four hours? Well, maybe not, not necessarily. But um, so your question of another program that we have is um, through the federal government. It's called the United States Department of Labor Closing the Skills Gap Grant. And we have found that we actually sent out a survey to all the 4,000 manufacturers that we have here, here in Connecticut need the funding and need the help to upskill their employees. This program is different. This is actually through the U.S. Department of Labor. It's in collaboration with the Connecticut State College System and CCAP, which I think you're familiar with. Also. Mary Bidwell and Ron Angelo and Alice Stiles at CCAP. And 11 industry partners in 2020 signed on for an application for a grant that would actually, with, excuse me, with the help also of um, Paul Murphy at ACM. And we received the reward of this grant. And I now have it, and we all have it now to offer to manufacturers who are listening today or tomorrow or, or whenever, thank you for the opportunity, that they can actually utilize this funding for their training one time, one time only. You have to have an apprenticeship program or un or excuse me, an, an unregistered uh, apprenticeship program or registered. Um, if it's unregistered, there's five criteria, but pretty much every manufacturer already um, tends to have. Mm -hmm. um, but the but the cost is is essentially 
It's not, it's not a lot. It's covered by the USDOL. And it's a chance to have your employees go through a training that you will get the benefit from later on. Mm -hmm. And when you're, when you think about, you know, workforce development in Connecticut, who do you guys partner with to help kind of drive change and help the workforce grow? Absolutely. We leverage our, our resources with our partners and that is the WIBS, the workforce, um, investment boards, uh, CCAT, who I mentioned, um, Connecticut workforce partners, um, all the associations, manufacturing associations that I work with that are actually under the, um, collaborative, um, the, the manufacturing collaborative. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the CMC. Of course. Uh, of course. So um, all those associations we partner with also, and we just want to leverage our resources to help the work for, the pipeline for our workforce in Connecticut. So you said you met you work with CCAB. We've had uh, Ron Angelo on a yeah. couple of times. I mean, you know, the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology is such a critical component, you know, here in Connecticut. We're lucky to have, you know, an organization like that that helps bring new technology, you know, into the manufacturing supply chain here in Connecticut. What's the relationship between kind of workforce development that you're doing and the technology that CCAT's offering? Like, what's that partnership look like, and how do you guys make that work? Well, um, it's interesting. I just went to one of their events last week, actually, yeah. um, and we work very well together. We are working on a project of composites uh, that is actually housed at our we're at Three Pent Road, the old. Um, Will Goose building uh, that Pratt and Whitney used mm -hmm. to own, and I believe they, they still do. And that's something to help the airline industry. So we, the collaboration has been amazing, I feel, than ever. I think in the past we've worked in silos, and I think now the, the collaborative efforts that we have are just going to help um, everything moving forward. Um, CCAT tends to um, have a little more... Uh, um, courses maybe for training that we won't have. So when we go back to the grant that I just spoke to, if we can't provide that for you, then CCAT, CCAT can. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can collaborate and help that individual who needs a certain type of training to, to move forward. So as you guys are thinking about like when you're doing the training and thinking about workforce, the technology keeps moving. Mm. How do you guys stay abreast of the current technology and, and what's there and make sure that people are getting the latest and greatest training? Yeah, really good question. I mean, I think everybody wants to be like a step ahead of everybody else. And um, like, I, like I had mentioned before, Mark Scheinberg is, is a visionary and he's on top of it. So um, we're, always, uh, we're always meeting and looking at the market and what's happening in the market. And it, essentially, it is the need of the marketplace, though, too. You know, it could be that it could be wind power, you know, but we can't just do wind power for one company, you know. Um, but it's, we are constantly looking at what manufacturers need. We meet with them um, pretty, pretty frequently, even during the pandemic. You know, we, we surveyed them a lot to see what their needs were to keep up with everything. I mean, we have the, we have really um, experienced instructors that have like, um, we have people that are, you know, you, you talk about welding. I, I saw something on the Today Show, you know, women in welding is something that um, is not very prominent, but we have a lot of, of women in our welding department. So um, I, and that is something like, it may not be automation, but it's mm -hmm. definitely something that I think is going to become more popular. Which is? Which is welding. Women, welding, women, women, women welding. Women in welding in women, particular? Yes. Love it. Yeah, women For, in welding. Forget Rosie the Riveter, you know what oh, I mean? Rosie it's going to be Wendy the Welder. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got that. That's amazing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. You, you talked about, you know, in um, you, you mentioned sort of this new technology and instructors. Is it is it difficult to kind of keep having people that know the new technology, right? Like it just seems to me we've got so many challenges in, in training, right? We got to make the investment. We got to have the new tech to train on. We got to have the, the programming. We got to pay for it. And we sort of touched on a lot of that. Right. But then you need someone to show how to use it. Has that been something that's been easy for you guys to find is, is folks to uh, to do the training? Um, I, I think that's, um, that's a good question. Also, I think that there's a challenge of finding the, the amount of instructors for any training right now, to be quite honest, never mind training that is more high tech right now. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that is a challenge. There aren't enough instructors out there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I'm finding is that not even just going into the high tech, uh, high tech world, but also just the regular, I'll call it 
manufacturing world with CNC, not even going to robotics, that there's not enough instructors that the schools are asking us, can you like train the trainer? You know, but we actually are, are um, we are working with and partnering with AARP because we are trying to recruit people that actually could help with that. Now, could that mean like helping with high tech? Maybe, maybe they came out of a company that's more high tech than not to help train the trainer so we can get more instructors for the industry. So fine. So sounds like looking for instructors is is something that you guys are anxiously after. Yeah. And looking for different avenues. What have been some ways that have been successful in the past, and like what could people that are listening do to help you know f- help find people that are engaged to train the next generation? Because it's an area that we've talked about so often, which is as the Connecticut workforce is aging, yeah. we feel like we're losing some of that tribal knowledge, some of that you know that craftsmanship. And it seems like a great opportunity for people to be able to train the next generation. You know, is that is that a fair assessment? Is that something you guys are looking to do? It's a, it's a very fair assessment, actually. Um, one of the courses that we have is is, is uh, advanced mentoring, and uh, we are working with a company where you're absolutely right. These um, these these people that have been at manufacturing companies longer that are aging out have the tribal knowledge, and sometimes they don't want to share it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to share it. So you have these, you know, young people coming in that are, like, ready to go and, and, and want to just, like, you know, take it and, 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 and take the tribal knowledge. And then, you know, but I think people get threatened also. So with this course, and, I, and I'm bringing our course up because it has helped. So I feel like if you have certain training for the um, aging workforce, be it, a mentoring course, be it um, when you retire, you know, why don't you get back to the community? Why don't you, why don't you take your, your experience and, and, and introduce that to, instead of sitting at home and, I don't know, sitting by the beach or whatnot, <laughs> give back. And of all the years that you have, you have given to, to the economy. Mm. How would they do that? So they can um, actually call me. Uh, if that's the case, um, um, we are, like I said, partnering with AARP, and I, I, I can see my contact information now. Oh, or, we'll put it in the notes. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's pretty much the way to do it right now. There are a couple of AARP events coming up that I would be happy to share also. Sure. So um, I, I think that's the way we could do it, really. I mean, I think there's a way to get, to get retirees more involved and to – you know, you know, the more experience that you have as an instructor, I don't know about you, Ari, but I don't want to sit there and listen to a lecture. No. I'd rather listen to somebody who's had the experience. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's something you talked about so important, which is we need to help. You know, listen, uh, you know, I, I think there's a misconception, to be honest, that people don't want to share. I think the vast majority of people would love to share and train people, but they don't know how. Yeah. You know, we never get taught as we're kind of working our way through our careers. Rarely are we taught the right way to mentor somebody. Rarely are we taught the right way to transfer our knowledge to somebody else, right? So usually it's sort of one of two ways. One is watch me and figure it out. The other one is I'll just like tell you, tell you, tell you, and then go do it. Both of which have challenges, right? Right. Um, So I think a training program on how to mentor is like really interesting. Do you guys get a lot of people that partake in that and and find value in that? We really do. We actually... um we took this course uh, across the pond to England. No kidding. Yes. Wow, look yes. at that. Language barriers <laughs> be darned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, we've had a tremendous, a tremendous success with it. Oh, that's really fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple other like kind of things I just wanted to, to touch on. You know, you know, one thing is we've talked a lot about upskilling, which is great. Yeah. But I think you guys also train people fresh, right? If somebody, if somebody's thinking, you know, I've been listening to this podcast or I'm out there, I want to get into manufacturing. Mm. That's possible, right? And you guys yeah, do that? Absolutely. Um, we, we have a program that's a 37 credit program. It's six months, six months, uh, 22 and a half weeks. Somebody could come in and you know there are there are Pell grants. There is there is um, financial aid. I, you know that's something that they would have to look into if if, if that even possible. Um, but we're finding that it's also like an apprenticeship program because they actually would work with. So t- during the first seven and a half weeks, a company could come in and interview one of the students, and and to see if there is a you know um, a rapport there. And they would actually take that 
take that um, that student, uh, an apprentice, so to speak, pay them on Fridays. But this program is pretty immersed. It's like every day, eight to three thirty. Mm. But if you think about it, you're you're going to school eight to three thirty. It's a job, so you're getting experience like you're working at a job. Yep. Then you get the you really get the experience working at the facility, right. and then the employer can say, "Wow, you're a really good fit," and then the and then the student can be like, "Oh, do I really like the atmosphere here?" Mm-hmm. And in the end, we've had a, like over a ninety percent rate of of getting everybody jobs because in six months you can you ready can, to you're, go. you're ready to go. So if, an, if I'm an employer, that sounds like it might be interesting for me to get a, be a part of that too. Yeah. So employers just like contact Goodwin and be like, yes. "Hey." That's super easy. They can contact me, absolutely. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So we, so when we're looking at, you know, well, let me put it a different way. I feel there's a lot of areas in the state that we have pockets of people where we could find great imp- people to be employed, right? Right now we've got tens of thousands, maybe over 100,000 jobs, you know, that are open. Mm. Um, do you guys do outreach to kind of underserved communities and help sort of find those pockets to train folks? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's an excellent question. That's something we're always looking to do. Um, we are working with a program called East Hartford Connects, and and that's where people go there to for some some help and how how do I you know we work with the the American Job Centers, you know, um, to partner with them to say, okay, we'll work with you. You work with us. You, you know, there's funding always available through the CARES CARES um, CARES Act. But there was. I think there's more funding next. There's always grants available. Mm. And we just always know the certain partners to partner with to help that, to provide the training to these individuals that need the skills. Those are great pockets of opportunity there. And if we can help train them up and get them jobs, we can sort of solve two problems at the same time. Absolutely. You know? that's, a, that's really great. Um, listen, as we're like kind of wrap it up, I just wanted to like go back a little bit and sort of talk about, you know, how did your time in government help you understand the needs of business, the opportunities for a workforce, and sort of navigate workforce development? That's a really good question. Nobody's really asked me that because it was so long ago. It was like 20 years ago. Yeah. But um, I, I really enjoyed it back back in the day because when you are talking to a company, and at the time I was working for a company that was um, helping, uh, helping the gap with bank credit because they were looking for loans, you know, a lot of them were manufacturing companies, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they needed money for capital equipment. And and I I found that really interesting back then and realized that, you know, everything is manufactured, right? I mean, everything that we have on, we, we, we drive, we our food, everything. And it's just so significant to be, to have people know how important that is. And so 20 years ago, I may not have been in the manufacturing business, but I saw that everything's a business. Mm-hmm. And then in order to be successful, you need partnerships, you need resources. And um, I learned that 20 years ago to get relationships that will best network you to the right people, that you find that a lot of people have the same issues, mm-hmm. you know, and, and through networking and, and, um, and the support of others. And, you know, I look at manufacturing as kind of our... Um, our family through the pandemic, right? You wouldn't you wouldn't abandon your family, so we supported our manufacturers. We didn't want to abandon them, mm-hmm. so I truly look at them as kind of a family to me. So, you, what did you feel like? So, you got some stuff from the public sector, sound like networking, building those relationships. Then you were in the private sector for a little while. What did you take from that that you think's kind of helped you? Yeah, that was um, pretty crazy. Um, I little did I know I'd be working like. And sitting in the conference room, listening to the sales of how many how many spring coilers were going to be <laughs> were going to be sold, and and if there weren't any spring coilers sold, then we were in trouble next right. week. And it. and it, you know you were in the trenches, and and it's not the greatest place to be. I'll be honest, um, but it was pretty interesting. I learned about s- springs and how they're made, and and things like that, and and just the opportunities that other people can have. I mean, and in be if it was 50 years ago or now, manufacturing is always going to be there and it's always going to evolve. And I just think that's so amazing. Yeah, absolutely. No question about it. Melanie, I'm going to move us to rapid fire round of questions. Are you ready? I don't know. All right, let's do it. Red Sox or Yankees? Red Sox. There we go. <laughs> Starbucks or Dunkin'? Starbucks. Staycation or exotic destination? 
Exotic Destination. Perfect. Favorite business book? Do you have one? Favorite business book. <laughs> Who Moved the Cheese? Oh, that's a good one. If you could do anything other than be the Director of Workforce Development at Goodwin University, and you had to do something else, but it could be anything in the whole world, Whoa. what would you do? I would probably get into um, working, um, giving back to the community in some organization. Okay, yeah. Non nonprofit. Type and non um, yeah, I mean, really giving back to kids that don't have the opportunity to find, you know, it, sometimes it's not easy to, like, you, like you, you're asking me, it's not easy to find the path of where to go if I'm not going to college. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we can have like a certain type of uh, organization that could show kids right out of, out of high school, come here, we'll guide you. Yeah, give you them know, opportunities. So, yeah, and j just give back. I just really want to give back to the community. That's great. What's something, Melanie, that you learned early in your life or early in your career that you think helped propel you to all the success that you've had? Well, so um, I got this one time, and it's sitting on my desk. It's a plaque, and it says, attitude's everything. And I, I believe that. Attitude is everything. And um, not a bad attitude, mm -hmm. but a good attitude. Mm -hmm. And and, and learn that you know with respect. And I, I actually got thanked one time from um, one of the governors I worked for, and I think that's really important. I think it's important to be really thankful to people, have empathy, and understand each other, because we're all going through something. Yeah, appreciation's everything. Look, absolutely, attitude can't change what happens to you, but you can control how you respond. What's one thing that you learned later in your life or later in your career that if you could go back and tell young Melanie and she'd listen to you, <laughs> you think would have a real positive impact? Oh, goodness. Um, Probably be more patient, actually. I think when I was younger, I was a little more reactive to things. So um, not oh, yeah. not to say I wasn't I'm not motivated, but reactive to things that maybe I could have been a little more or less reactive to. Yeah, listen, patience is so key, right? <laughs> listen, Melanie, thank you so much for coming on today. Workforce is such an important topic. Always happy to talk about it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and spending some time with me today. You know, my goal is to help build a community where we can learn and grow together. Your input, feedback, and engagement is critical to making that happen. Please do comment, like, and subscribe so more and more people can hear what we're doing and join our community of growth and success. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you again soon.